And so today we are happy to have uh, Gareth Jones from the University of Manchester, and he'll be talking about an effective beta Wilke theorem for Pfaffian functions and some Diophantin applications. Right, so thanks very much for the invitation. So I was supposed to be in New York almost exactly a year ago giving a talk. So it's nice to be able to do it, even if it's not in New York. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about an effective Peter Wilkie theorem. Um, so I'll start by talking about the, the original Peter Wilkie theorem. And to do that, I need to define a minimal structures. Um, so um, for this talk, I'll write R bar for the um, ordered field of real numbers. And when I have some expansion of R bar by some extra things, then that's said to be O minimal. If every definable subset of the line in this structure is a finite union of points and open intervals. So because I have the, the less than here in my language, um, any subset that is a finite union of points and open intervals will be definable. And the minimality condition is saying we don't get any more subsets of, of the line. Um, so some examples of minimal structures. Uh, if I take the real field and I add all restricted analytic functions, so that means I take all functions which are analytic on some open set in R to the N, um, and I take a compact box contained in, in that open set, so B is my box, and I restrict F to the box, and I add all of those functions, so all functions of that form, then that structure is O minimal, and that's called Rn. So the aminality there is essentially due to Gabrielov using um, following work of Wojciech, but Van den Dries actually observed it using those results. Um, so if I take the real field and I add the exponential function, so that's not of this form because um, I add the exponential function on the whole real line. Now uh, that's O minimal, that's the result of Wilkie from 1991. And then I can put both of these together and I get R and X, uh, and that's O minimal, that's Van der Dries and Miller. Um, so I'm not really going to use these things, but this is just to give you some context for the, when I state the peter wilkie theorem in a minute. Mm. So the peter wilkie theorem is about um, rational points lying on sets definable in O minimal structures. Mm. So it involves a height, which we can just take to be the most naive height. So I have a rational number, um, written as a over b with co-prime integers. And I define the height of that rational number to be the maximum, the absolute values of a and b. And then if I've got a, instead of a, a rational number, I can have a tuple of rational numbers and I can take the maximum of the heights. Mm -hmm. And then if I'm given some subset of r to the n and some bound, then I write x, q, h for the set of rational points lying in x with height at most h. Now the aim of the peter wilkie theorem is to give good bounds on the size of this set when x is definable in an O-minimal structure. But there's an obstruction to that um, because this, this set x could be, say, the real line, and then it will contain lots of rational points. Or more generally, it could contain um, could contain a rational line or a, um, a curve or something. So we define the, the transcendental part of X to be X with all the algebraic part taken away. And the algebraic part is the union of all connected infinite semi-algebraic subsets of X. So semi-algebraic means um, definable in R bar. Um, so we take all the kind of algebraic things that are contained in our set and we remove them. So all those possible obstructions for having a good bound on the set and the size of this set here are in, hopefully in this x alg. And the peter Wilkie theorem says that that is the case. So, um, so here's the theorem. So we have a definable set x in some O-minimal expansion of the real field. Then for every epsilon, there's a constant such that for all h, the number of points in this, in this transcendental part of x 
of, of, of line in Q to the N with height at minus H is less than or equal to CH to the epsilon. So um, if I take uh, X to be Q, then X Q H, the number of points there is roughly H squared. Um, so this H to the epsilon is, is a much better bound. This is a, a very good improvement on the kind of trivial bound of H squared or H to the 2n uh, for X in Rn. Um, so this is a, a substantial improvement on the kind of trivial result. And in fact, this bound here, this is best possible. In the sense that um, if you're given a function epsilon of h, which tends to zero, then you can find a, a definable set in some O minimal structure such that for an infinite sequence of heights, it will have at least h to the epsilon of h rational points of height h. Um, so this bound here, in general, in the generality of all O minimal structures, this bound is best possible. Okay, so that's the Peter Wilkie theorem. What are we interested in? Um, so we're interested in, uh, if we're given a concrete O minimal structure, so concrete means, means something where we can kind of get our hands on some description of the sets. Can we bound the constant? So this, this C here, can we, can we give a bound on that C that's effective in terms of epsilon and some kind of description of x. So we want the, the constant in the theorem, we want to give some way of bounding it in terms of some epsilon and some kind of description. So when I say concrete here, I mean something where I have some kind of description of x. So we'll, we'll see more precise things later. So what's the motivation for this? The motivation is that the, the peter wilkie theorem has been used in in Diophantine geometry. And, and it's kind of the ba most basic cases of the application say you get some finite set of points. Um, and what we'd like to do is be able to describe that set of points, give a way of computing them um, in terms of the data of the Diophantine problem. Now, in some of the applications of Peter Wilkie, the main obstruction to doing that is the Peter Wilkie theorem. So, in, in some applications, so not all. So, in some applications, Peter Wilkie is the main obstruction. To effectively so what's the what's the obstruction to making the peter wilkie theorem effective um, so the the original proof by peter and wilkie uh, it uses the compactness theorem of first order logic which is not effective. Um, and lots of kind of general O minimality For instance, things like cell decomposition. And in general, we don't know how to make those things effective. So those are the kind of, this is, these are the obstructions to getting effectivity. And, and this, this is the motivation. So we'll, we get effectivity using Fafian functions. So, so now I'll talk about Fafian functions for a bit. Um, then I'll talk about our result briefly. And then I'll, I'll sketch, well, I'll just state a few Diophantine applications. 
Okay. So, Maffian functions. So, um, suppose I have a, a simple open set. So that means something like a an open box or a product of open intervals. And this, I have a sequence of analytic functions on that open set. That's called a Fafian chain. If I can describe the derivatives of the functions in the chain polynomially in the function I'm at and the ones before. So I have a kind of triangular system. Um, so as I go along the chain, the derivatives depend polynomially on the one I'm up to and the ones I've already met, but not on the ones further down the chain. So here you see that the i here goes from one up to the length of the chain, should be a big X. And I'm in the in the in the polynomial equations here, I have f1 up to fi. Um, so the simplest example of a Fafian function or a Fafian chain is if I just take x from r to r. The Fafian functions played an important role in, in Wilkie's proof of the minimality of the exponential function. Um, so that's a Fafian chain, and then a function is Fafian with this given chain. If I can write it as a polynomial in in the variables and the functions in the chain. Now, if I'm Fafian functions have a, a notion of complexity, so what I'll use is the format of f is going to be some bound on all of this stuff. So I've got the n here, the l, the length of the chain, and then all of these polynomials, the degree of those. So I just add those. And then I've got another complexity measure, the degree of f, which is the degree of this polynomial here. Um, and I want to separate that because um, in Diophantine applications, this degree will correspond to the degree of the variety we're studying. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce some sets that are defined using Fafian functions. So Fafian sets. So let's fix a chain and an open box B whose closure lies in my simple um, domain U. So then a restricted Faf semi Fafian set is a subset of B that's picked out by setting some Fafian functions equal to zero and making some positive. So all of these GIs and the HJs, they're all Fafian with the chain that I've got here. And then I can define, given a set like this, I can, I can define its complexity. The format will be just the maximum of the formats of these functions here. And the degree will be the sum of the degrees of these functions, the function defining it. And then a restricted subfafian set is a projection of a subfafian set. So I take some coordinate projection pi, I project my sub uh, semi fafian set here, and that's a subfafian, a restricted subfafian set. And then I put the format and degree to be those of the thing I'm projecting as a set of the form. Sorry, this should be a y. Um, so I take some y as above. And then I take the degree and the format are the degree of the thing I'm projecting. OK, and if I forget about the b here, and I just take x in u, so now my Fafian functions might have singularities on the boundary of u. And I make these definitions, then I get semi Fafian and sub Fafian sets. So I drop the restricted. So, what's an example of a um, a restricted subfafian set, if I take the Weierstrass p function um, and I restrict it to some compact box contained in the complex numbers, and then I take its real part and its imaginary part, so those are real analytic functions on this box, then by a result of McIntyre, the graphs of these functions are um, restricted subfafian sets. 
And you see, these are some of the kind of things we see sometimes in the Diophantine applications. Okay, so here's the result. Okay. Um, so this is joint work with Galvin Yamini, uh, Harry Schmidt and Margaret Thomas, and it's still in progress. So it says, well, briefly, it says if we have a restricted subfaffian set, then we can get um, an effective form of the peter wilkie theorem for it. Um, so in more detail, slightly more precisely, if we have an F that's going to bound the format in an epsilon, then there are computable numbers with the following property. Um, if I take any restricted subfaffian, whose format is bounded by the F and its degree is at most D, then the number of points on that restricted subfaffian set from the transcendental part of height at most H is bounded by some uh, effective constant times D to the gamma. So this, this aspect wasn't present in the original Peter Wilkie theorem, times H to the epsilon. So what this is saying is that the, the constant in the Peter Wilkie theorem, which would be this, is effective and polynomial in the degree of the subtraffian set. So constant is effective and polynomial in the degree. Now, if I have a just a um, zero set of a Fafian function, not restricted, um, then I can get the same result as this. I can get a bound of this form just by, um, so I have like my zero set, something like this, and I um, kind of take larger and larger restrictions. Um, and because the, um, the restrictions will all have the same complexity, so, um, the bounds here won't depend on the restriction I take, and any point of height h will be contained in some restriction. So I get the bound for zero sets of Fafian functions, even unrestricted. In the in a general unrestricted case, so when I have a um, x just sub Fafian, um, I get we get a similar result, but but it's just effective constant, just get effective C in terms of uh, F and D. Um, in fact, our results are a bit more general. So the, the restricted subfafian sets correspond to an O-minimal structure, namely the O-minimal structure generated by restricted Fafian functions. So in the definition of RM at the beginning, if I took all of the Fs to be Fafian, then the sets I'd get there are more or less the restricted subfaction sets as I've defined them. In the general unrestricted case, we don't know if that's true anymore. And, and our result actually holds for all definable sets, but you have to associate a notion of complexity to them. So I don't need to, do, I won't do that here. Um, is the bound independent of F? Uh, no. So the, the constant here, these constants depend on F uh, and, and badly. Um, but the, the point is that the, the dependence on D is quite good, it's polynomial. So they're, they're effective, like we can compute them from F in principle, so we wouldn't want to do it. Um, but but they, they do depend on F. Um, Okay, so that's the that's our result. Um, so I'm just going to compare it to what was known already. Um, so Galvin Yamini, he has a stronger result in a more general setting. Um, so he still works with restricted functions, um, and he gets a a bound of the form log h to a power. Um, but his constants. Uh, they're, they're less uniform. So in our setting, 
there would be something like a dependence on, well, so in our setting, the Fafian functions, all the PIJs would have to have um, algebraic coefficients. And the constant here would depend on the, the, the height of those coefficients. So it's sort of, it's not as uniform. Um, and Margaret Thomas and I had, had proved a similar result for Fafian surfaces. But our result wasn't quite as neat. You needed a definition of a certain form. And in our result, there was no, no polynomial dependence. And for those who, who know the kind of more complicated forms of Peter Wilkie, like we get the general um, form due to Haberger and Peter, but I won't talk about that. Okay, so I'll just state a couple of ingredients for the proof. So, so like I said, there's in, in the original Peter Wilkie proof, compactness is used. Um, so to avoid using compactness, we do what Margaret Thomas and I did, and we work in families the whole time. Um, and when you do this, you really appreciate the compactness theorem. It, it makes things a lot neater, makes the whole proof easier to write down. <laughs> um, but, but, but if you work in families, you don't need to use compactness. Uh, now, in the restricted case, we use lots of the lots of results from effective Fafian geometry. So this subject kind of started with Havansky and then was developed a lot by Gabriel and Vorobyov, and we use a lot of their results. Um, now, with these ingredients, we'd get, we could get effective peter wilkie probably, without the polynomial dependence on the degree. But to get the polynomial dependence on the degree, um, we use a modified approach to part of the proof of peter wilkie called parameterization. Uh, due to Binyamin and Novikov. And we use a cell decomposition result for restricted subfafian sets due to Binyamini and Vorobyov. Um, in the unrestricted case, in the general case, uh, everything relies on work of Gabrielov, who kind of gives um, um, effective bounds in, in the general setting of, of sets definable using Fafian functions, so possibly unrestricted, where we, we don't know any kind of uh, model of Venus result. Okay, so um, before we talk about Diophantine applications, we need the functions involved in the Diophantine applications to be Fafian if we're going to use this result. Um, so when do we have that? Um, well, at the moment we have it when the, the application involves fixed elliptic curves. So we'll see some examples in a minute. Uh, now, the kind of most famous applications of the peter wilkie theorem to andre Ault type problems, I don't think the functions there should be Fafian. I mean, we don't know, but they shouldn't be somehow. Um, but in the, in the case when you have a fixed elliptic curve, Harry Schmidt and I showed that um, the Fafian definitions a uniform in the elliptic curve. So, so the format and the degree don't depend on the elliptic curve or can be, can be made to not depend on the elliptic curve. So with the uniformity in our counting result, this, this can sometimes lead to more uniform Diophantine applications. So I'll finish the first half an hour with a few more, a few applications. Um, so first is uh, a Manny Mumford result. Um, so I take two elliptic curves with complex multiplication, and I take the number field I get by adding their J invariance, and I assume that the elliptic curves are given by Bierstrass equations over that number field. So then I take a curve in my product of elliptic curves, and I suppose my curve is divided over some L extending K. Now, the Manning Mumford conjecture is going to tell us about torsion points. So, torsion points of this abelian variety that lie on the curve. And it's going to tell us that there are finitely many. So, we have to assume that um, we have to assume something. And what we assume is that V is not contained in the translate of an elliptic curve by a torsion point. Um, so, under that assumption, there are effective constants, C and M which don't depend on anything. So if I have a point, P, lying on my curve, um, and it's torsion 
of order n, then the n is bounded in terms of the degree of L over k and the degree of the curve uh, V. Um, and this polynomial dependence here, this is what comes from the polynomial dependence in our counting result. Um, so recently there have been a lot of uniform Manny Mumford results um, by uh, DeMarco, Krieger, and Ye, and Dimitrov, Gao, and Habiger, and most recently by Kuna. They're all much more uniform than our result. <laughs> um, but what they give is bounds on the number of points. Um, so this result actually gives a kind of uniform way of computing all the torsion points. Um, so we also get the result, the general kind of higher dimensional Manning Mumford result, but that's quite nasty to state, so I, I won't state that. Um, so the next application is, uh, is a genuine unlikely intersection problem. It moves beyond torsion points. So now I have just an elliptic curve over a number field, and I've got my curve, but now in E times some power of multiplicative point. Um, and I suppose, uh, so I, like I fix an affine equation for E and I have my coordinates on my curve here. And I suppose that the, the E part is not identically torsion and that the multiplicative part, multiplicatively independent. Um, so then there's, there's an effective N which depends on everything such that there are most n points on my curve where I have torsion on E and multiplicative dependence on the GM side. Um, so this is a very special case of something called the silver pink conjecture, um, and it's effective. So Bauer and Shah uh, in 2020 proved this without the effectivity. Um, so they, they had some partial effective results using completely different methods. But their whole proof, the only um, the only ineffective part of their proof is an application of the peter wolpe theorem. And because all of the functions involved are Fathian, we can make that application of peter wolpe effective, and then we get effectivity in their result. Um, so I'll state one more result, if that's okay. Um, sure, yeah, that's fine. Uh, uh, it's the most technical. <laughs> so for this one, I fix an elliptic curve. With complex multiplication, and I still assume it's given by a bias stress equation over uh, Q with its J invariant. Now, this one we consider a family of GM, oh, that shouldn't be an M there, GM extensions of E. So I have groups which sit in an exact sequence like this. And this G is varying in a family parameterized by the dual of E which is isomorphic to E. So I have kind of a family of these people, which say GP with P varying in E hat. So now I take a curve in this family, defined over a number field extending my base field. And I suppose that, um, ah, so my family, I'm supposing that these, these Gs here are varying, genuinely varying. They're not all isomorphic to each other. Um, and then I suppose that when I project this curve down to E hat, um, what I get is infinite. And I make this assumption that V is not special. Uh, so the special ones are the ones we know the theorem doesn't work for. Um, but the special is a bit technical, so I won't say what that means. Um, but under these assumptions, I get effective absolute constant C and M such that if I have a point of torsion in its fiber um, of exact order N, then N is bounded in this way here. So polynomial in the degree, polynomial in the, in the field, in the degree of the field of definition of the variety over the base field K. Um, so this result gives um, an effective and uniform version of part of a result due to Bertrand, Massa, Pillay, and Zanier. So their, their, their whole result is more general. So the, in their result, the E here is also allowed to vary. Um, so you could have like a, the Legendre family of elliptic curves or something, and then a varying family of GM extensions. But if you fix the E, 
then everything involved can be defined using Fafian functions. And then Schmidt and I can, can show this. Um, okay, uh, thanks. So that's the end of my first half hour. <laughs> Okay, so uh, thanks, Garrett. So maybe let's all unmute and uh, thank Garrett for his nice talk. Okay, do we have any questions at this point or maybe comments? I have a, I have a question. Sure. Um, uh, Gareth, it's about, um, okay, I mean, I guess it could in principle be about a few different slides, but but like the the first uh, Diophantine application, uh, like about the product of elliptic curves, I think. Maybe. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna here. Yes. Uh, yeah. So so compared to these other results that that come later, can you say, um, can you say like what uh, what additional uniformity did those have yeah, compared to uh, what you 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 did? So. So at least I can say something for this one. Actually, there's another one I should mention that came much earlier. Um, so that's David Philippon, uh, which is from like 2000 and something. Um, and, and so the, the DeMarco Krieger yay result, I can't state it exactly, but roughly if you have a curve in a product of two elliptic curves, there's some extra assumptions, um, but then the curve, there'll be a uniform bound on the number of torsion points on the curve. You mean, so it doesn't depend on, it doesn't on the depend degree on, of L over K. That's right. It doesn't depend on, on the degree of the field. Um, and you can't do that. I mean, yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you bound the order, you have to do, it has to depend on the degree of L. Yeah, okay. But if you, in these results, they bound the number, and then you can get much, much more uniformity. I see. But like, um, for instance, in the in that result of like DeMarco Krieger Yi, like, okay, I mean, one of the, I guess it's a special case, of course, of their result is where you just take the curve uh, to be basically uh, the two coordinates are equal. So the point is like- Yeah, so I'm their result, the, the, um, the two elliptical, the two elliptic curves are not isogenous. Yeah, the, yeah. Um, yeah, but I mean, if you just take, say, like the curve to be something simple, like, you know, basically x equals y, I mean, for suitable names of the coordinates, then like, I mean, it doesn't your result give like the same amount of uniformity, basically? I mean, yeah, I mean you can, so you can, we can actually get the same amount of uniformity, but then we have this big assumption uh, here. Right, our curves have oh, CM. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I see now. I see um, now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we need that um, yeah. for the Galois bound part. So ah, the okay. so much more uniform Galois bounds are known in the CM case. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and in the general case, the uniform bounds. So there are uniform bounds known. So that was a big result of Morel in the 90s. Um, but they wouldn't give, they're not polynomial, they, they would be like oh, some small power of a log or something. They wouldn't be big enough. Okay, okay, ah, interesting, thanks, thanks. Okay, so I suggest we save the other questions for after the, the breakout room. So let me now uh, stop the, the recording.